Welcome everyone. I'm Rebecca Goldbert, the Executive Director of the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. We welcome you to a special webinar entitled Israel Before International Law Mechanisms. This is part one of a two-part webinar series on international law perspectives on the war. This semester, the Helen Diller Institute is continuing to explore the impact of war and the questions facing Israel and the region in several different ways. Bear with me while I share several of our upcoming programs. In today's conversation, we will examine Israel before international law bodies in the conflict, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and various other UN human rights mechanisms with international law scholars Yuval Shani and Elena Tchotchko. On April 10, in part two of this webinar series, we will zero in on the sexual and gender-based violence on October 7th and its aftermath with law and gender scholars Kohav El Kayam Levy and Masua Sagiv. We are also holding a two-part webinar series on the impact of the Israel-Hamas war on the Arab-Palestinian community in Israel. In part one of this series, legal scholars Manal Totri Jubran and Masua Sagiv explored the Arab-Palestinian experience from social, political, and legal perspectives with a focus on discrimination, rights, and remedies and the complexities of citizenship. On April 15, in part two of this webinar series, education scholar Ayman Akbaria will continue this conversation with Masua Sagiv from a civic educational perspective with a focus on citizenship, education, religion, and belonging. We will also continue our long tradition of programming in Jewish law, thought, and identity. On April 3rd, we will host in person our annual Robbins Collection Lecture on Jewish law, thought, and identity with Yehuda Kurtzer, president of the Shalom Hartman Institute. We will also be hosting a conversation in person with author Yossi Klein-Halevi and Professor Ethan Katz on April 15th. Lastly, we continue to invest in our students with a cohort of 30 undergraduate fellows engaging in leadership training, including how to have difficult conversations and how to engage across differences and planning relevant programs for their peers. Please refer to our website, social media, and our email blast for all of these upcoming programs and for recordings of past programs. All of the programs, activities, and events of our institute are dependent on philanthropic support from the community. We thank you for your continued support. I'm honored to introduce you to Yuval Shani and Elena Chachko, speaker and moderator for today's program. Yuval Shani is currently the co-director of the Center for Transnational Legal Studies at King's College in London. He is also the Hirsch Lauterpacht Chair in International Law and former Dean of the Law Faculty of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He was a member of the UN Human Rights Committee from 2013 to 2020 and served for one year as chair of the committee. He currently also serves as a senior research fellow at the Israel Democracy Institute, the chair of the Hebrew University's Minerva Center for Human Rights Academic Committee, co-director of the faculty's International Law Forum and Transitional Justice Program, and the head of the Cyber Law Program of the Hebrew University Cybersecurity Research Center. His research focuses on international human rights law, international humanitarian law, international courts and tribunals, and international law in cyberspace. He received his LLB from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, his LLM in International Legal Studies at NYU, and his PhD in International Law at SOAS University of London. Elena Chachko is an Associate Professor of Law at UC Berkeley School of Law. Before joining the faculty, she was the inaugural Rappaport Fellow at Harvard Law School and a Miller Fellow at Berkeley Law. Motivated by experience in diplomacy and intelligence analysis, Professor Chachko's research explores the intersection of law and geopolitics. Professor Chachko's interdisciplinary work draws extensively on political science and social science research methods. Professor Chachko is a member of the Berkeley Working Group on Emerging Technology Governance under the leadership of Secretary Janet Napolitano and Professor Andrew Reddy at the Goldman School of Public Policy. She also advises the Administrative Conference of the United States in a study on international regulatory cooperation. She received her SJD and LLM from Harvard Law School and an LLB in Law and International Relations from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Please join me in welcoming them. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca. 
Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all uh, to tackle these incredibly difficult issues um, around this tragedy that has unfolded since October 7th, uh, the attack uh, that led to the killing of uh, hundreds of civilians in Israel uh, and the kidnapping of hundreds more. Uh, and the Israeli response that has now generated what is broadly considered to be a deep humanitarian crisis in Gaza uh, that has impacted not just Hamas, but also uh, millions of civilians currently in the Gaza Strip. Um, so welcome, Yuval. Uh, and what we would like to focus on today uh, is just one portion of the manifold legal issues that arise around this war. Uh, and that is the participation and the involvement of international institutions, international adjudicated bodies uh, in this conflict. And the idea is to sort of walk through uh, what is going on. There are so many proceedings currently unfolding in various institutions uh, and try uh, to give our audience a better sense of what is going on, what the prospects are, what the potential impact might be uh, on how uh, the war uh, is being uh, conducted uh, and its potential and and uh, result. Uh, so Yuval, why don't you start by um, giving us um, uh, the basics of the role of international institutions uh, in this conflict, how they became involved, what their limitations are, uh, and what is going on, basically. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. And uh, I also thank the Helen Diller Institute uh, for hosting me and Rebecca for uh, the very uh, lengthy and uh, introduction. Um, uh, so, so uh, like you said, uh, we are dealing uh, with one aspect of a very complicated and tragic situation. Um, and maybe it's, it's good to start with this insight that, uh, and that is that international courts uh, in international law do not have uh, general jurisdiction to deal with international disputes or international problems. Uh, international law, unlike domestic law, where you have courts uh, typically available uh, and open for litigants to pursue their grievances, in international law, uh, you uh, effectively need uh, the consent of the parties to the, to the dispute uh, for the court to actually initiate proceedings. Uh, the result of this, that many very dramatic uh, international crises, like the Syrian civil war and, and, and many others, uh, it's quite difficult to bring uh, legal proceedings against states and even against individuals involved in very flagrant violations of international law. So this is the basic uh, conundrum, the basic dilemma that everyone who deals with international law has to confront, and that is that you have laws, but you often struggle to find a legal venue in which you could actually uh, adjudicate cases on the basis of these laws. Now, having said that, I mean, the, um, given the magnitude of what we are seeing and the uh, unique amount of uh, international attention, uh, we have seen some uh, some attempts to initiate uh, litigation uh, that tackles uh, some aspects of the dispute of the conflict. Uh, and again, I emphasize that it's only uh, the tip of the iceberg. Um, and we can go systematically through the different processes, but maybe the four uh, interesting venues that we could discuss is first the International Court of Justice, which is a forum that deals with interstate disputes. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to identify either, either consent uh, for uh, taking the case to the court or what typically a treaty which gives the court uh, what is called jurisdiction over uh, specific disputes relating to that treaty. And we have already two legal proceedings that were based on the Genocide Convention, and we can discuss that later, that were brought before the International Court of Justice. Uh, they are both at a very early stage of the proceedings. Uh, another venue is the International Criminal Court, which deals with war crimes, crimes against humanity, also has jurisdiction over uh, genocide charges. Uh, here again, uh, there are certain difficulties, although uh, relatively speaking, the court has a broader uh, spectrum of jurisdiction in this specific situation because 
of the Palestinian uh, authorities' attitude towards the litigation, which is quite positive. Uh, a third venue would be the world of international human rights law, where you have a host of bodies, international committees, uh, what are called experts or rapporteurs that deal with uh, different human rights of different population groups and sometimes different uh, treaty norms. So uh, we have an expert who deals with torture and another expert with extrajudicial executions and another one with the, the rights of the child, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is last, if we'll have time, we can also discuss what's happening in domestic courts because international law is, is, is not only applied in international courts, but it is also uh, applicable in domestic courts. And we've already seen in some countries uh, litigation relating to the dispute, either uh, in domestic cases that challenge um, the willingness of certain governments to provide Israel with assistance, military aid and the like, or uh, attempts to start um, uh, criminal proceedings against uh, Israeli officials. So we already are seeing uh, quite a few procedures uh, starting. Uh, each of these proceedings raises its own set of issues and problems. Cumulatively, I think they do underscore A, the relevance of international law to the conflict and B, the, the very uh, significant interest uh, from many quarters of the world to try to basically capitalize on existing international norms and, and initiate legal proceedings. Thanks so much. So let's maybe um, try to drill down a little bit on the case that perhaps got perhaps the most attention uh, in uh, international discourse, which is the genocide case uh, currently pending in the ICJ. Um, so could you say more about uh, why genocide, the Genocide Convention was the vehicle selected for uh, this case by South Africa, what is going on in terms of where the court is, the provisional measures, uh, Israel's compliance with the provisional measures, uh, and where we are uh, in those proceedings. Right. So on, uh, on December 29 of 2023, South Africa brought legal proceedings against Israel on the basis of the Genocide Convention. Uh, the Genocide Convention is one of these few conventions which Israel, um, Israel has ratified a number of, of human rights treaties and the like, or humanitarian law, but most of them do not have a jurisdiction clause. Do they, not, they do not empower the International Court of Justice to deal with disputes relating to the treaty. The Genocide Convention is one of the few treaties that are legally available. Um, and, and as a result, in order to actually seize the International Court of Justice, South Af Africa could only feasibly bring a case under the Genocide Convention. So even though um, many experts would, would agree that, uh, that it is more likely that many of the issues that are discussed uh, deal with compliance with the laws of war and therefore would implicate the Geneva Conventions or maybe uh, more serious allegations of crimes against humanity, um, these avenues, war crimes or crimes against humanity, were not legally available to South Africa for the purposes of an international court of justice case. So they had to basically go all the way to the most uh, dramatic treaty that there is, which gives such jurisdiction, and that is the Genocide Convention. Um, and we can discuss maybe later what are the elements under the Genocide Convention, but I will, I will, uh, I will maybe know that the threshold for establishing genocide in international law is notoriously very high. So, uh, so from a litigation point of view, uh, South Africa has, uh, has gone on a limb. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the court's jurisdiction, this case builds on a, on a decision that the court has reached uh, several years ago in another case where we have seen the same strategy employed, and that is that a state that is not directly related to a dispute, bringing a genocide allegation case to the International Court of Justice on the basis of the theory that genocide is uh, an international crime that concerns the entire international community. And therefore, every member state that has ratified the Genocide Convention could uh, basically hold to account uh, before the International Court of Justice, all uh, other state parties. So the case in question was a case brought by the Gambia against Myanmar in connection with the uh, alleged genocide of the Rohingya minority 
in Myanmar, and the court has decided several years ago that it does have in principle uh, jurisdiction to deal with this case in South Africa, uh, effectively relied on that precedent to make a similar argument that Israel is allegedly uh, perpetrating genocide and, and that it could hold it to account before the International Court of Justice. Now, a case before the International Court of Justice of this nature uh, can take a very uh, long time. I mean, we do have cases from the 1990s, genocide cases involving the war in the Balkans, uh, which took the court about 14 years to, uh, com to complete from start to finish. Uh, so we are not talking about a case that is going to be decided within a matter of months. We are talking about a case that will take probably many years to resolve itself. However, uh, the court does have, um, according to its statute, the power to issue in the interim what are called provisional measures, which are like uh, um, an injunction, which is uh, issued within a domestic court case in order to stop one of the parties, the defendant, from taking irreversible steps that would render the case no longer relevant when we get to the merits. And here in South Africa, the first step that it took within the, within the litigation of the case was to request provisional measures from the court. Uh, there were hearings uh, that took place in mid-January and towards the end of January uh, this year, the court has issued certain provisional measures. Uh, it did not accept South Africa's main uh, request, which was to instruct Israel to uh, seize the war, to seize the military uh, operation. Uh, but it did instruct Israel to uh, take measures to ensure that it is not implicated in the commission of genocide and specifically to handle incitement to genocide and to uh, enable uh, the uh, introduction of humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip so as to uh, prevent the risk to, to, to genocide uh, uh, to the uh, Palestinian population. Uh, following this, uh, Israel has submitted a report on its uh, implementation of the provisional measures. South Africa came back to the court again and alleged that what Israel has been doing is not nearly enough to uh, implement the judgment and that the humanitarian situation in Gaza is uh, seriously deteriorating and that now uh, it's, uh, it's a state of uh, uh, the border of famine, already famine has been at, at onset. Uh, and therefore it asked the court to review and revise its provisional measures. And a few days ago on March 28, the court has accepted again, part of the South African request and has issued even more explicit measures with regard to the uh, facilitation of uh, humanitarian aid. So this is where we are uh, in that specific case uh, where the court will hear uh, in the next uh, months or even years, uh, other uh, motions that are relevant to the case. A, does it have jurisdiction to deal with the case? B, whether to admit third parties as interveners, which is something that is also possible in international adjudication. And we already have uh, one country that is formally requested to intervene. Other countries have announced that they plan to request to intervene. And eventually there will be a, a decision on the merit. So this is one arena which is currently pending. I will also mention that there is a parallel case uh, which has been launched by Nicaragua last month against Germany, also on the basis of the Genocide Convention, which is, uh, and other treaties as well, I should say, that uh, request the court to order Germany not to support Israel, to uh, basically withdraw support uh, from Germany to Israel, because by doing that, Germany would be allegedly complicit in violations of international law, including genocide, and the court will be hearing uh, arguments for and against the issuance of provisional measures in that case as well next week. Thank you, Val. So interestingly, um, this case, or perhaps even predictably, has generated um, both celebration and criticism. So many on the political left celebrated it as a vindication of the role of in international institutions of uh, what they believe to be a valid accusation of Israel uh, as a country engaged in the perpetuation of genocide. 
Uh, but others have pointed to the fact that um, this is an instrumental use of the only legal vehicle available to South Africa, which is the Genocide Convention, uh, and that it obscures um, other uh, issues, other international law issues that are perhaps more um, uh, relevant to what is actually going on on the ground and more important. Uh, and now all we do is talk about the genocide case while there are other issues that are perhaps more important and more uh, um, in need of discussion and debate. Um, and another set of criticisms is obviously the fact that Hamas is completely out of the picture here because the ICJ does not have jurisdiction over Hamas as a non-state actor. Uh, and that is also a gaping um, um, shortcoming of uh, the ICJ as a, um, an avenue for debating various legal questions arising from this war. Uh, so what is your take on these views? What is your what are your thoughts when you uh, read these uh, various kinds of commentary about the cases? Right. So, so first, it's not surprising that this is a very it's a, an extremely uh, contested situation. And of course, people have uh, very strong views, uh, not always strength, not only not always great familiarity with the facts of or, or the law, but they uh, almost always have very strong views on this conflict, which is, uh, I guess, understandable given the you know the the magnitude of the conflict, the number of peoples who are involved, uh, the length, the duration, etc. Um, in terms of uh, what the court, uh, maybe it's worth saying before before uh, delving into some of the specific issues you raised. Uh, maybe it's important to, to underscore what the court actually did say in terms of finding, because there is some uh, um, mis, mis maybe interpretation or misrepresentation of what the court actually did. The court did not hold that a genocide is being committed in 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 the Gaza Strip. Um, what the court and it also didn't say that it's plausible that the genocide is being committed um, within the Gaza Strip. Uh, what the court said is that the allegations uh, made by South Africa uh, plausibly implicate some of the rights which are uh, governed by the Genocide Convention. Now, this so sounds like a, a lawyerly nuance, but it 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 it, 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 it effectively means that the, the 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 Genocide Convention is relevant to the case. Uh, but the court at this point in time uh, hasn't really uh, made any factual findings on how likely it is that a genocide uh, is, is occurring or any other violation under the Genocide Convention. And I should say that the Genocide Convention prohibits genocide, uh, but it also prohibits other things such as incitement to genocide, where Israel, I think, is in a, is in a a more precarious um, situation given the statement uh, uttered by some Israeli politicians and, and, other, um, and other public speakers. Uh, so this is what the court has effectively said. Now, uh, is this a strategic use of, uh, of litigation? Yes, I mean, it must be regarded as strategic use. Uh, countries, uh, but this is not surprising. I mean, countries typically go to uh, adjudication not because, uh, not only because they believe in international justice, uh, which could be one reason, but also because they uh, believe that it would serve uh, their uh, geopolitical interests. And in that regard, uh, international adjudication is not so different from strategic litigation at the domestic level which is also often motivated by uh, extra legal considerations. Uh, li like we said before, uh, South Africa had really no other uh, avenue if it were to bring the case to the court, but uh, make um, a genocide claim. And I think part of the reason why they went down that route was that uh, a couple of years before, uh, Ukraine uh, was actually uh, quite successful in bringing a very uh, strange or very creative genocide case against Russia for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And you want to say a little more about what was what what in particular was creative about Ukraine's right. of the convention? 
So unlike in the case before us, they were not arguing that Russia was committing genocide in Ukraine. They were actually uh, arguing that Russia was, was falsely maintaining or, uh, or submitting that Ukraine is committing genocide against the Russian speaking uh, ethnic groups in the east of Ukraine who are in the Donbas region and that Russia's intervention was allegedly designed to protect these um, uh, victims or prospective victims of genocide. Now, uh, this is a very difficult case to make uh, and the court has already effectively held a few uh, weeks ago that it would have very limited jurisdiction going forward and could not actually review the, the Russian invasion. But when it uh, reached a provisional measure stage at the very early stages of the war, Ukraine actually did get from the court uh, a, a very strong provisional measure ordering Russia to stop the war. It was actually so remarkable that it was even, uh, the court went beyond what Ukraine even asked it to, to do. So, so, uh, so I guess the fact that the court was willing in the past to uh, insert itself into a, a very high profile global state of war was maybe um, an encouraging sign for uh, South Africa that they should try as well. And maybe the fact that they have failed so far in doing this, although I should say that in the more, more recent decision, uh, it seems as if men, uh, not an insignificant number of judges were leaning in that direction. Uh, maybe that will, um, going forward, would uh, reduce the motivation to engage in such strategic litigation. Now, on, this, on the issue with Hamas, I actually think that one of the main reasons why the court didn't issue uh, the provisional measures that were requested by uh, South Africa is the fact that the court realized that it would be untenable uh, for the court and for its uh, reputation to actually engage when you have a situation of war, uh, engage in provisional measures relating to the very conduct of hostilities that uh, attach only to one party to the dispute. So I think that this might, must have served as, um, as, a, as a constraining factor on the court's willingness to actually order the, uh, the secession of the war. Uh, in international law, I should say the fact that one party is not present or is not complying with the law does not release the other party of its obligations. But when you have a very bilateral uh, conflict situation, it is somewhat of a restraining factor. The court did, I should say, uh, in both decisions that it had issued on provisional measures, did call upon Hamas to unconditionally and immediately release the Israeli hostages. Uh, but uh, so far, this has not happened. I, I will note for the record that the, uh, I've mentioned the provisional measures to Russia. Of course, the provisional measures were not complied by Russia either. So, so the fact that the court is generating provisional measures doesn't mean that this would actually be enforced. For that, you really need the Security Council to, to go into action. And when Russia is on the receiving end, and also sometimes when uh, the United States and its, its close allies are on the receiving end, the likelihood of Security Council enforcement is, is, is somewhat limited. Yes, so that's an interesting point you touched on uh, in the latter part of your answer here, and that is the effectiveness of uh, ICJ decisions overall. But before we get there, uh, we keep mentioning the concept of genocide and different people understand it differently, but there is a legal meaning uh, a legal doctrine um, right. that governs um, what genocide is for purposes of international law. Uh, it leaves a lot open, but still there are precedents and there is uh, a particular approach that the ICJ has taken uh, toward this question. So could you um, tell us uh, what the legal standard for genocide is right now uh, and how likely it is that um, South Africa will be able to meet the requirements for proving that what Israel is doing in fact constitutes uh, genocide. Right, so the, the, the terms uh, of what constitutes genocide are fixed in a treaty, a 1948 treaty, the Convention uh, on the Prevention uh, and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. 
Uh, and this is a treaty which both South Africa and Israel and many other countries are, are party to. Uh, that, that treaty defines what constitutes an act of genocide. Uh, the, there are two key aspects that the, the treaty uh, mentioned. One is the destruction um, of a group in whole or in part. Uh, and the treaty actually lists a number of measures that would constitute act of destruction. Uh, they could imply uh, physical destruction, such as killing or uh, torturing members of the group, but it could also involve in certain cases uh, some other, uh, other acts, such as deliberately inflicting uh, inhabitable conditions of life or forcefully removing uh, children from the group uh, to uh, another group or preventing birth and the like. So uh, the, the acts have to be directed and to, uh, to the destruction of the group. And the second aspect, and this is really the, the, the harder to prove aspect, is the intent. So it's not enough that act, the destructive acts of killing or torturing or uh, imposition of uh, uh, impossible conditions of life have been introduced, but the introduction of these measures must be undertaken with the intent to destroy the group uh, in whole and in part. And the group has, is also defined in, in the convention as a national uh, uh, racial, ethnic, or religious group. So we do have um, these two conditions of which the, uh, by far the more difficult to prove is the, uh, is the element of intent. Because intent, we know even in domestic criminal law, it's quite difficult to prove intent. Uh, and this is what is called a special intent. So it's not just uh, being um, aware, cognizant of uh, what is being done. There has to be here uh, a specific desire, a specific uh, will to actually obtain uh, a certain uh, outcome. Uh, the problem is that how are you going to uh, prove this? And the court, uh, as I mentioned before, in the, Bosni in the Bosnian cases, uh, and also a case involving Croatia and Serbia in the 1990s, the court had established uh, the legal standard for establishing genocide and effectively said you can do it in two uh, ways. Either you discover a plan, a genocidal plan, so you show uh, that the high command, uh, the military high command actually was operating on the basis of a genocidal plan. Of course, in history, we do know that this can happen. The Wannsee Conference, uh, where the Nazi leadership has decided to exterminate the Jews is, of course, a spectacular example of such a plan. But we also know that in many other cases, uh, including cases involving genocide, um, no such plan is, is readily available. In those cases, the court said you can infer genocidal intent from the actual acts, providing that a genocidal intent is the only uh, possible inference from the acts in question. And this idea of only possible inference is considered in the in in the literature, which is sometimes critical of the court, as an impossibly high threshold to reach because even if the, the um, even for instance in the Israel uh, Hamas case even if the case is that Israel is um, careless about civilian casualties it pursues prosecutes the war against Hamas and it is uh, it does not introduce sufficient levels of care it does not uh, uh, introduce sufficient uh, humanitarian aid provisions uh, still, that in, in and of itself, it would be hard for South Africa to show that the only possible inference from uh, these uh, facts is that there is an intent to, to, to commit genocide and not to uh, focus the attention on, on Hamas or to even uh, expedite the surrender of, the, of, the, of Hamas by rendering conditions uh, even more difficult, uh, applying the, the logic of a very uh, stringent uh, siege. Again, I'm not saying that this is what's happening or not happening, I'm just noting that the threshold um, is going to be quite difficult. That of course doesn't exclude the possibility that specific soldiers or even units 
uh, do have um, do act on the basis of uh, genocidal intent. And then the obligations of Israel would be to investigate and punish these specific uh, soldiers or units uh, or those who incite for genocide to genocide. So there could be context, even if you are not able to show that the entire prosecution of the war is genocidal in its, in its general intent and direction, you could still maybe show that specific uh, acts or specific aspects do qualify, and this would be something that will have to be discussed on the merits. So on, the, on that basis, answering your question, it's a very, um, it seems like it's a very tall order to, to prove genocide in, in each case. And, and I think in this case, uh, it's going to be quite difficult. Right. And of course, I think we can both agree that Israel is at least obliged to um, try to prevent statements that call for uh, the annihilation of the population in Gaza. And we have examples of senior cabinet members who have espoused similar views. Um, so I think legally, uh, you can say that that is a basic obligation that Israel has, even if the higher threshold of genocide uh, is not um, met in this yeah. Yes, I said before that this is an area where the Israeli position is more precarious because we did have these statements. Not all of these statements that are being cited by the South African case or even by the court in its decisions are uh, are clearly uh, fall within this threshold. I mean, even the discourse around hate speech and and, and incitement to genocide. Uh, has to be uh, has to uh, include a, a contextual analysis of who said what to whom and under what context and under what circumstances. But there would be certainly, uh, I would say, certain statements, uh, including by cabinet ministers, who appear to uh, warrant an investigation and even perhaps uh, prosecution. Um, so the next question uh, is going back to one of the points you, you made earlier, which is about the effectiveness. And I see some uh, questions in the Q&A from our audience also raising similar um, yeah. um, concerns. So we said that the only way for the ICJ's decisions to be enforced uh, is through action by the Security Council or political uh, action by powerful actors who are interested in seeing ICJ decisions uh, complied with. Um, so assuming uh, there is no realistic uh, prospect of that happening uh, in the present circumstances regarding the war in Gaza because of the political uh, um, uh, interest at play, what is the significance of the proceeding? Um, assuming that the operative measures uh, cannot be enforced in the standard way you think about enforcement. Well, I mean, first, I mean, I wouldn't assume, I mean, uh, Israel is not Russia and it's not the United States. So, uh, and it's not China. So, so uh, it's not beyond possibility that Security Council resolutions that would be based on the court's decisions, uh, maybe not on all aspects of the court decision, but uh, I mean, we have seen uh, only um, a week ago that the Security Council has accepted the resolution, uh, which is um, uh, actually cited in the, so here it actually went the other way around. I mean, the Security Council passed a resolution on humanitarian aid and calling for a, a Ramadan ceasefire and release of the hostages. And the uh, International Court of Justice seized on that resolution. Uh, it's not impossible that the Security Council going forward would actually use language from the provisional measures by the court in future resolutions. So I wouldn't say uh, that this is um, completely beyond the, the realm of, the, of possibility. Uh, it is still appears less, less plausible that the Security Council would take the next step, and that is uh, the imposition of sanctions, uh, which the Security Council in theory can do, but actually in practice is never done in any international court of justice proceedings. Uh, although one could say that the very existence of this unconventional weapon, so to speak, has been uh, a deterrent on states to simply ignore the decisions by the international court of justice. 
So uh, you have that avenue, and that avenue uh, doesn't seem to be extremely promising, but I wouldn't say it's completely hopeless uh, for those seeking to enforce decisions. I think the much more interesting avenue is really in the more uh, bilateral setting, where states are uh, already under very, some states who uh, support Israel uh, and provide Israel with military aid and intelligence are already under increasing pressure, both politically, but also legally within their domestic administrative law frameworks to uh, seize uh, such support. And we've also seen an attempt to bring international proceedings against Germany on the basis of a similar approach, that is that Germany would be complicit uh, if it would uh, continue to support Israel. Uh, and the more the International Court of Justice uh, takes the view that Israel is violating international law or that there are very specific obligations that Israel has to meet in the specific circumstances of Gaza, uh, the greater the pressure is going to be on these governments to, uh, to basically change course and we've already seen, uh, at least in one country, in the Netherlands, where uh, a court of appeal um, uh, issuing a decision that uh, the Netherlands cannot uh, provide uh, replacement pa parts for Israeli airplanes, F-35s, because um, it, it didn't cite the International Court of Justice opinion, but it did uh, cite uh, some UN reports and some NGO reports that claim that uh, Israel is violating the laws of war in its operation and in its targeting decisions. And as a result, uh, no uh, supply parts can be provided. The case is being appealed, but we, uh, for the time being, it's the, it, it, it stands. So um, I think what Israel fears is that having an international court of justice decision uh, that um, is on the record is going to uh, generate many more cases like this and is going to uh, make it much easier for domestic courts or domestic politicians to make the case against supporting Israel going forward. All right, and I have to say on this point, I've been studying uh, U.S. sanctions for a long time uh, and to see um, that tool um, designations and sanctions under the International Economic uh, Emergency Economic Powers Act uh, levied against Israelis is a very strong message. Uh, and I'm talking, of course, about the designation of individuals who were involved in um, violence against Palestinian population in the West Bank. Um, right. So that is a powerful single signal from the United States that... Uh, and it's not only the United States. We right. have a similar list by France and the UK right. and the EU. And so it does seem so, so far it's focusing on Mm -hmm. settler violence. You also have the U.S. dealing in a very different context on uh, on sort of uh, surveillance companies, um, spyware companies, uh, but uh, it could very well be that uh, military officials or even politicians involved in specific decisions or in specific statements relating to the conflict would find themselves on the receiving end of some sanctions or uh, international criminal court proceedings, which is another uh, legal avenue that we have unfolding. Yes, so I do want to spend some time on those other um, institutions that are uh, involved uh, on various legal aspects of this conflict, but I also want to spend some time on accountability for Hamas uh, and just drawing on some of the questions that I'm seeing uh, coming from the audience. Um, what are the international law avenues for accountability for Hamas? I can speak a little bit about the domestic, the, at least the U.S. domestic aspect of it, because there have been lawsuits uh, brought by uh, victims of the October 7 attack against Hamas and against those who uh, assist Hamas, like Iran. Uh, so there's that um, uh, line of cases unfolding right now in the United States. But what are the avenues under international law that are available, if any, uh, given right. that Hamas is a non-state actor. It's a non-state actor, and um, like the Palestinian Authority, which is uh, which has a quasi-state status, it is an, uh, it's a, an observer state in the United Nations, it's party to treaties, it has assets, the Hamas is already designated as a terror organization in the US, in the EU, in some other countries, so um, in, in paradoxically, it's less vulnerable 
to legal proceedings because it is already operating uh, very much outside uh, the, the a legal framework uh, of uh, of international relations or inter international economic relations and the like. Now, um, on the other hand, the, the issue of accountability, uh, since you do have, I mean, Israel is in the picture and Israel is keen on, uh, it already is uh, detaining um, many, many hundreds of uh, Hamas terrorists, uh, suspected terrorists, and it's going to uh, put them on trial. I mean, uh, it's not uh, clear at this point in time how would these trials look like, whether they're going to be uh, ordinary military trials or whether they're going to have a special commissions, uh, which is something which... Uh, uh, the U.S. has had uh, an experience with after 9/11, which uh, generated, you know, its own uh, um, anxieties. Uh, but um, there would be, on the domestic level, uh, there would be legal proceedings, probably uh, in Israel and in other countries, against the Hamas leadership uh, under uh, either domestic Israeli law or under universal jurisdiction, which is this theory that uh, courts can deal with serious international crimes regarded of where they were committed. And there are already certain uh, investigations in European countries against uh, Hamas leadership. Uh, and uh, it, is not, uh, it is not impossible that that leadership would find itself implicated in these legal proceedings. There are all also, uh, like you said, all sorts of economic attempts to seize uh, assets uh, to freeze accounts, to designate uh, certain associations affiliated with Hamas as unlawful associations and the like. Now, the main venue for accountability for Hamas at the international level is the International Criminal Court. And the International Criminal Court has already announced that it is going to uh, investigate uh, crimes committed by Hamas. And the prosecutor, Karid Khan, who uh, visited both uh, Rafah the Rafah crossing, but also Ramallah and Israel itself, and went to the kibbutzim, uh, who where some of the massacres occurred, uh, announced that he uh, is is his position is that he has jurisdiction to deal with crimes committed by uh, Palestinian nationals, uh, including in the territory of Israel, and on that basis he uh, plans to pursue uh, crimes, serious crimes committed by Hamas. At the same time, uh, it is more than likely that he would also seek accountability on the Israeli side, partly in order to avoid the optics of um, distorted or biased justice, apply, applying justice or double standards, applying justice only on one side of the conflict. So it's likely that we will see in the next few weeks, if not, or months, we will see uh, um, either arrest warrants or uh, more information coming out from the International Criminal Court about legal proceedings, probably against Hamas leadership, but also against uh, some Israeli um, officials or civilians. Yes, yeah, so this leads to a broader question, which is an imbalance that exists in international law and has been long debated uh, ever since um, the concept of the war and terrorism began in the United States of um, the fact that international law is still built around states uh, and um, does not allow uh, enough consideration of situations in which a non-state actor is involved. Uh, and that has been a debate that is ongoing and that has generated a lot of controversy. Um, so my question to you is, do you think anything about the present war uh, can nudge this debate forward and um, um, encourage reform in that direction in the law, um, realizing that international law as a whole uh, is at a state of crisis at the moment for various reasons uh, and various developments over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, what are the prospects of reform? What are the prospects of uh, international law moving forward and um, uh, adjusting to accommodate the types of conflicts that we see today as opposed to the types of conflicts that existed uh, earlier in the 20th century when most of these legal norms uh, were formed? 
Yeah, so, so I would say that this is not, uh, I mean, not nothing new under the sun, but we did have, I mean, for many, many decades, there has been, there have been concerns about what to do with non-state actors. Uh, they could be uh, parties to a civil war. Um, there could be uh, guerrilla fighters who are fighting from across the border. Um, and uh, it's true that international law uh, has not been able to generate a very, clear and uh, and well um, adjusted framework to deal with this because uh, of the same problems that we have discussed before in connection with the Security Council. And this is that the interests of the major uh, players are not aligned and it would be very difficult to uh, push, the, push the ball forward without actually having some consensus. We did have a brief moment of consensus after 9-11 and in that aftermath, there has been there have been some Security Council important Security Council resolutions on uh, counterterrorism and on what is sometimes colloquially called the, the global war on terror, it, mostly on issues relating to terror funding and cooperation in um, in the application of criminal law to terror offenses. But that has been a very a relatively short lived uh, window of cooperation. Uh, and we are now back in a, in a situation where it's very difficult to agree on on major changes. So the game, so to speak, is mostly about interpreting the laws that we have. And here we are seeing uh, a polarized world. I mean, we do see uh, the global north uh, effectively pushing for more flexible for more flexibility and for allowing states to deal with failed states or with non-state actors that are based in states uh, that uh, use and use their territory as launch pads for attacks. And on the other hand, we do see the global South countries uh, quite uh, resistant, resistant to, to these sort of um, ideas and maintaining that uh, interventions, even in a counterterrorism context, are, are impermissible. Uh, what we are seeing in this conflict, perhaps, uh, I think, cuts in both ways at the same time. I mean, it doesn't really resolve the big questions. But I think there has been, because of the unique situation of Gaza, which is really uh, an area which is part of, um, of a quasi-state, but is controlled by an entity which is completely at odds with the other part of the quasi-state. So we have Hamas and the Palestinian Authority who are in themselves uh, sworn enemies. Um, so so I, th I think that in that regard, Israel's uh, right to exercise self-defense did uh, at least initially attract uh, relatively broad support, uh, maybe even broader than some uh, war on terror related uh, applications of force. On the other hand, you do see uh, generally, like you asked before, in terms of symmetry, uh, you do see very limited appetite to hold Hamas accountable. Uh, both for its, um, not only for its crimes, but also for the conditions uh, in life in the Gaza Strip, which are uh, partly because of uh, its decision to start the war and also for the manner in which it, per it, it, persecutes, the, it, it prosecutes the war, which is uh, effectively pushing the, uh, the combat into urban, uh, urban settings, which are creating uh, mass casualties and also creating very significant difficulties in terms of dispersal of humanitarian aid. And here there is this, uh, in a way, uh, general tendency to ignore any role or any uh, responsibility that Hamas has and to basically place uh, the responsibility fully and squarely on Israel's shoulders. Yes, so that's a very uh, interesting point. Um, and I do want to leave some time to talk about uh, other avenues for accountability, other avenues, other international forums uh, that have been involved in this conflict. So what can you tell us about the work of the human rights bodies um, to date? What are you seeing there? Right. So um, I like the Ukraine-Russia war, where you do have two countries with, who are part of a region where you have a strong regional court, the European Court of Human Rights, with relatively broad jurisdiction, and therefore you do have thousands of cases 
uh, brought by Ukrainian citizens against Russia pending before the uh, European Court of Human Rights. And you also have four what are called interstate cases, cases brought by Ukraine versus Russia. Uh, with regard to Israel and Hamas, it's, it's much more difficult. First, there is no regional court that is relevant. The Middle East or Asia do not have uh, human rights courts. Uh, and also uh, Hamas is not, um, is not a party to, to human rights treaties. So, so um, to begin with the uh, availability of avenues for um, contentious litigation, one party be a human rights victim or be that a state against another state are less available, given the limited involvement both of, of Israel and also the Palestinians in such uh, uh, treaties that create such uh, an infrastructure. What you do have, however, is you do have within the human rights, uh, UN human rights apparatus, you do have many other entities, uh, which I've mentioned before, these experts, which are called uh, rapporteurs or so working groups, that have uh, typically they would have specific mandate either to deal with one country situation or to deal with one human rights violation or one group of victims. And there we have seen uh, actually these groups uh, being quite active in generating uh, many reports and many statements on the situation in Gaza, generally being extremely critical of Israel. And, the, and its record of, uh, of human rights uh, compliance. Israel is, uh, I should say, quite hostile to many of these bodies and considers them to be um, either lacking in professionalism or not having in place uh, a robust fact-finding process or politicized or all of the above. Uh, another actor which is maybe has not so far inserted itself um, into the picture, there is an ongoing commission of inquiry, which has been established by the Human Rights Council uh, in 2022 to uh, review ongoing violations of human rights in the occupied territories. Uh, and there have been some calls by the UN leadership to uh, allow that commission of inquiry to look into violations that occurred in Gaza. Uh, here again, Israel reviews very negatively this commission of inquiry, uh, maintains that uh, its composition is very anti-Israeli, uh, that members have been implicated in, uh, even in uh, one, it has been alleged that even one member has made anti-Semitic uh, uh, comments, etc. So, so the likelihood that we will see either um, extensive cooperation between Israel and these human rights bodies or um, a very um, open engagement with their findings uh, appears to be quite limited at this point. So we've talked about the ICJ proceedings, we talked about the idea of genocide and international law, we talked about accountability for Hamas, we talked about uh, other um, international institutions that have been involved in this conflict. Um, and I want, as we approach the end of our time, I want to try to move away from the frame imposed by the, juris the various jurisdictions of those international institutions and talk a little bit more about what's actually going on on the ground. Uh, and I want to ask you as an international law expert, what do you think, setting aside the frame of genocide that's very effective as a rallying cry, like we already said, is probably not the best legal um, construct uh, to apply in this case. Setting that aside, what are the real concerns that you have about the way Israel has prosecuted the operation in Gaza? What are the main challenges in terms of compliance with international law? Uh, the way you see it, recognizing right. that we have limited exposure to the facts on the ground, the um, uh, intelligence behind some of the operations that Israel is launching. Uh, but based on what you're seeing, uh, what are your main concerns? Yeah, so, so, so that's a very important caveat. And that is that we, um, like I said before, many people express very strong views with very limited access to the facts. So I, I would like to caution myself and ourselves. Uh, I mean, law, uh, especially in situations of armed conflict, is notoriously difficult to apply because of you know, the proverbial uh, fog of war. Uh, which means that we do not have good access to the facts, um, partly because 
um, it's a war zone and there's uh, and coverage is going to be extremely challenging uh, and when it uh, and the coverage that is uh, mediated by both parties would likely to be somewhat tendentious uh, and we are living of course in an era of uh, disinformation so we have to be quite you know um, somewhat skeptical or, or, or critical of the information that we, we receive. But on the basis of what we have seen, I think there would be some areas in which Israel would have to answer some very uh, serious questions. And maybe I could say uh, I, I could deal with three issues, uh, although there are more. One, there would be questions about targeting criteria. There have been uh, 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 it's uh, beyond question that the amount of um, harm to both to individuals and also to infrastructure, to houses, to uh, buildings, um, to uh, public house, public structures, etc., to infrastructure has been uh, very, very significant. And one would have to basically uh, come up with uh, reasonable explanations, plausible explanations as to why. Uh, specific uh, targets, specific um, uh, buildings, uh, infrastructures were uh, affected. I mean, we know that in some cases uh, Hamas did position itself in schools or hospitals, and of course this is a very important contextual factor, but uh, the amount, I mean, the scale of destruction uh, does place a heavy burden on Israel to justify uh, the scope, I should say, that in international uh, humanitarian law, the laws of war, uh, the uh, examination is really on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to show, uh, but the, the fact that you have so much destruction does um, invite a question, uh, an, an examination of the criteria. What is the criteria for uh, for, for uh, targeting? Uh, the second uh, issue, I think, is a very serious issue, which is the use of uh, or misuse of humanitarian aid as a, as a tool of war. Uh, I, I think initially uh, there were some very uh, worrying statements that were made by uh, Israeli officials uh, that effectively used uh, the disruption of access to humanitarian services uh, such as electricity of war or water as a sort of uh, punitive measure or a sort of uh, of uh, of a measure that is designed to uh, apply pressure uh, I think this is, this would raise uh, questions under international law there are questions how much uh, Israel was obligated to provide Gaza before the war started given that Israel's position is that the area was not occupied. And I think that Israel has a good uh, legal argument regarding the non-occupation of the territory uh, before the war. Otherwise, had it been occupied, there wouldn't have been a need to invade and reoccupy it. Uh, but now that Israel is there and it does have responsibility uh, for most of, uh, most of the areas where it has troops or it at least has the potential to control, there are questions as to whether it is doing enough in order to uh, ensure access to humanitarian aid, not only allowing trucks in, but uh, in trying to fix infrastructure to ensure that people have access to water and to, um, to, to basic food. So that's a second area. And uh, maybe uh, the third uh, issue is has to do with the uh, question of the um, movement or displacement of population from North Gaza to the south. Uh, that when the measure was introduced in the beginning, uh, my position at least was that that was a reasonable uh, precautionary measure that was designed to move away civilians from the areas in which the most active and uh, intensive uh, fighting takes place to areas where, which are relatively uh, calmer, although not outside, of course, the danger zone. They are dangerous, but less dangerous than the north. But at, at some point in time, uh, when the war actually moved southwards, uh, refusing to return the uh, the displaced individuals to the north and with conditions in the south deteriorating, humanitarian conditions deteriorating, uh, I think there would be explanations that have to be given. Now, I'm again 
on all three issues, I'm somewhat tentative because the terrain is, is extremely challenging and it has to do with the fact that Hamas does operate from within uh, civilian population, does not maintain distinction, uh, might actually uh, deliberately complicate humanitarian missions in order to gain propaganda points. Uh, all of these factors have to be considered, but in the end, Israel would also have very serious uh, uh, answers to give to these sort of questions. Yes, and I want to emphasize what you said about this being a case-by-case -case inquiry, uh, an operation-by-operation -operation inquiry, because I hear the argument a lot that we are at 30,000 civilian casualties based on reports in Gaza, uh, the um, vastness of destruction of structures uh, across the Gaza Strip, all of those things um, cumulatively uh, indicate that Israel has long exceeded whatever proportionality uh, allows. Uh, what is your response to this argument? Well, that's not how typically international law uh, handles proportionality analysis. I mean, you could make, make of course, the argument on a, on a political or moral level that this is too much and, uh, and the, um, the harm outweighs the benefit or, uh, or, or from uh, um, the, that this has become a, a war of retribution, etc. But in international law, this is not the test. You either look at the at the question of with regard to specific targets, whether an operation in Shifa Hospital was uh, was proportionate to the military need to conduct the operation when calculated against uh, anticipated civilian harm, or you can look uh, more strategically as whether Israel is still um, fighting a, a war of self defense. Um, is still uh, has it eliminated the serious threat, military threat that it sought to eliminate post October 7th? And since Hamas is still uh, an active fighting force and is still um, has the intent and some capacity to inflict, uh, continue to inflict harm on Israeli civilians. Um, under these conditions, the, inter the traditional tests of proportionality in the laws governing the use of force do not seem to have been met. Uh, by the way, of course, the, the figure that you cited, again, this is something we have to take uh, uh, with some grain of salt. I mean, it could be the numbers. I mean, the numbers could even be higher. Uh, but obviously, uh, whatever the, the precise number is, one has to factor in that under the laws of war, uh, militants, combatants, um, they're uh, actually not counted uh, on the violation side, but actually from the laws of war perspective, it goes exactly in the opposite direction, uh, targeting a, a militant could even justify a certain collateral harm uh, on the part of the civilian population. That has to do with the fact that wars are very nasty business and the laws of war are not pacifists and are not human rights instruments in the traditional sense that we have within a domestic country. So the numbers, uh, well, when dealing with numbers, which is all, always very difficult because every single loss of life is, is, is a terrible tragedy, but when you are trying to make this judgment, you, have, you, you cannot really in good conscious do this analysis without actually asking yourself, okay, how many of, of these um, casualties were civilians and how many were combatants? It's a very different picture if there are 20,000 combatants and 10,000 civilians, or if it's the opposite, it's 10,000 combatants and 20,000 civilians. And we, we, we do have to know, and the information that we are getting is extremely limited because even the numbers relating to children uh are not really um uh do not we do not really have any information about whether they are 19 or 18 or 17 which is of course makes a big difference in terms of what is the likelihood that they could be involved in in the armed belligerency okay so this is a somewhat pessimistic uh place to stop but we're approaching the end of our time um one last question from the audience um, that uh, I might pose to you has to do with the issue of selectivity uh, under international law. 
And the question goes like this. There are 40 armed conflicts ongoing. Will all of them go before the ICC? Sounds like the elements you, are, you have mentioned now would apply, but don't seem to generate any action. Uh, so there's this argument that there is disproportionate uh, attention brought to conflicts in which Israel is a party um, and not similar attention uh, to other conflicts that are going on around the world. I personally don't find those arguments very persuasive uh, because every conflict needs to be um, um, judged on its merits. Uh, but there is an argument to be made that there is more attention brought to uh, those kinds of conflicts than other comparable ones uh, going on around the world. Uh, right. So any thoughts you want to share about this? Well, I, I would agree that there is a huge amount of media interest and public interest in what's happening in the Middle East and in Israel-Palestine. And that uh, is uh, a remarkable amount of interest. Uh, and, you know, one can draw uh, his or her conclusions, whether it's, uh, it's, um, it's something good or something bad, it's justified or unjustified. As far as legal proceedings go, I would say that this has not been the norm so far in the conflict to actually generate uh, much uh, legal proceedings, uh, partly because of the jurisdictional structures that we talked about, which make it quite complicated. And the fact that Israel has not exposed itself, unlike many other countries, uh, to international adjudication. So actually for the International Criminal Court, uh, the maybe paradoxical situation is that the court would need a Palestine case, uh, so to speak, in order to deflect criticism that it has been, that all the cases that it had so far uh, and were brought to, tr to trial involved African defendants. And there is a very strong claim in the African continent about selective application of international criminal law to African perpetrators as opposed to um, perpetrators from other regions or from other skin colors. And I think there is this sense uh, that the court uh, taking on the Ukraine case and taking on the Israel-Palestine case uh, would actually uh, make some headway um, towards uh, deflecting this criticism. So. I guess that selectivity, at least with regard to international adjudication, is, is like many other cases, sometimes in the high of the beholder. So many uh, areas in the world feel that they are uh, over-targeted or even sometimes the selectivity goes in the other direction. Uh, so people in Sudan are very upset that there is not enough attention to the plight uh, of, uh, of, the, um, of people who are dying also uh, of starvation and war uh, in that region of the world. So it is somewhat of, um, of, of a difficult assessment to make both factually, but also politically and morally. Thank you, Val. Uh, and I think this brings us to the end of our time. Uh, thank you so much for bringing so much clarity to those incredibly difficult issues, both from the legal perspective and the human perspective of what is still going on on the ground. Uh, and uh, with thanks uh, to you for taking the time to do this for the benefit of our audience, I will bring, uh, pass the baton back to Rebecca. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for your very, very challenging and well-framed questions. And you all, thank you so much for bringing us some knowledge and insights into these very complex issues. I'm very appreciative to both of you for taking the time today and thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you all, bye-bye.